welcome to part four of our four full season workshop series. Uh, part four is summer because, as you hopefully know by now, our season starts in the fall, goes through winter and spring, and then transitions very radically for summer. So we kind of consider it the last season of the growing cycle for South Florida. Um, I'm Tiffany Noe from Little River Co-op. Uh, we are a small farm and we teach people how to garden and we sell plants from this nursery here which is located in the historic agricultural district of the Redland which is south of Miami. Okay, so what is so special about summer? Well, you live here. <laughs> So you probably have some ideas about what makes summer so special in terms of growing food. It is all about how unique the climate gets here in the summer. You know, if you think about how the climate affects you as a human living here, you know, it gets very, very humid. You know, it's very sticky to be outside. There's a lot of moisture in the air. The temperatures also increase, you know, so the daytime averages go from like the low 80s to the low 90s. And those 10 degrees make quite a difference for humans experiencing being alive in South Florida and for plants. And there's a lot of rain. I mean, really beautiful, monsoon-like, crazy thunderstorms. You know, they sweep through in the afternoon. They bring inches and inches of rain. The rain moves a bunch of stuff around. You know, it's like it really activates the environment. And also something that we love to talk about with people in terms of the climate in the summer is nighttime temperatures. So it's very common for people to assume that because it's hot in places like New York or California, you know, which is true, it's, it's also hot there, um, but in a desert environment like California or in a temperate one like New York, the temperatures plummet during the night and not only is that quite a relief for all the humans living there. They get a little bit of a break and they get to maybe like put on a shirt or something or a sweater. Um, it gives plants like this very vital break from being really hot too. It's like a super duper key ingredient to being able to grow plants in July when it's 90 something out on your farm in California versus here. So here, because of the humidity, and the tropical nature of our climate, the temperatures barely fluctuate from day to night, you know, so we have something like usually a three to four uh, degree drop to the nighttime, and so the night will also continue to stress out a plant that isn't used to a humid, intensely hot environment. So, South Florida, um, I like to correct people sometimes because I've spent a long time correcting myself. South Florida is not in the tropics. You know, the tropics is like a region of Earth and we are not in it. But we are in a tropical climate. So whenever I talk about the climate, I really like to say tropical climate, you know, because that gives you a really good proper framework for um, Googling, and figuring out what type of plants are going to work here during our most intense season, which is the summer. So, we Americans down here are used to a specific type of crop for eating in the kitchen uh, as part of our cultural diet. It's usually this kind of commonly referred to as like a Western European annual vegetable crop. So what do I mean when I say that? I mean like round red radishes and broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and tomatoes and lettuce and celery, you know, so the stuff that you see in the grocery store, all of that, you know, is was has been bred for a really long time to thrive in like a very temperate European 
there's a winter, there's a summer. The winter comes, there's frost dates, and then the summer is this time when you plant all that stuff. And the summer is also temperate, so it's like cool-ish, you know, not like our summer. Uh, but here, because of the summer being so intense and because we have no frost dates, so it never frosts down here, we grow all of that stuff in the fall. We started in the fall, usually October, because September is also very, very rainy. So while it's technically the fall transition, it's like really can be a really challenging time to garden. Um, we start that stuff in like October and then we go really hard through April and then we're always trying to push it. That's very farmery of us. Uh, shoulder seasons in terms of like the economics of farming are very important to make sure that you can extend your season as long as possible. But when it comes to home gardeners, we tend to encourage people to follow the seasons a little bit more because they're beginners, because there's less on the line. You know, they're not trying to like get to some financial goal that's going to make it so that they can farm again the next year. <laughs> uh, so we really encourage people to farm with the seasons, go with the flow, follow a few farmers uh, in your area. I mean, gardeners, not farmers, because the farmers are going to be the ones pushing the seasons. Uh, gardeners, follow us, and then kind of like slowly transition your garden as we transition our inventory into summer appropriate plants. Okay, so what's a summer appropriate plant? Excellent question. <laughs> a summer appropriate plant is one that has genetically, you know, lived in a place where the temperatures and the climate and the rainfall and the humidity and all of that stuff is appropriate to that plant. So um, when we talk about finding summer appropriate plants, we like to encourage people to look to other parts of the world where the climate is similar. So in America, we are very, very unique. Uh, you may have heard me mention in other um, workshops or you may have just discovered on your own that the USDA separates the country into plant hardiness zones and that they span oftentimes many, many states and they are meant to um, allow farmers and gardeners to share resources amongst their zones. So if you're in zone like eight, let's say you get to share like planting dates, frost dates, harvest dates, calendars, varieties, all that stuff with everyone else in zone eight because the USDA has kind of grouped them all together and said like this, the climate through this band of America is really similar. We are in zone 10B, so we're like not even in a full zone, we're in a sub zone and it is itty bitty. It is like Lake Okeechobee uh, to the Keys. That's it. The Keys is actually zone 11, even more intense down there. So we're in a super duper duper unique USDA plant hardiness zone in America, but we are not in that unique of a climate because there's the tropics, you know? There's a lot of other countries that have a monsoon season like we do, there's a lot of other countries where it's like very, very humid um, all the time, where there's lots of rain, where there's high temps. So my favorite country to use as an example is Thailand because their climate is very, very similar to ours. There's also parts of India and parts of Africa that we are very similar to. And there's the Caribbean, which I don't ever want to forget the Caribbean. Um, because it's right there and the climate is super, super similar to ours. And within the U.S., the closest climates to us are Hawaii and Puerto Rico. So you can also look to the cuisine of Hawaii and Puerto Rico for inspiration. So to go back to Thailand, you know, it's like if you think about like the flavors that are traditional in Thai cuisine, like lemongrass and turmeric and cardamom or the vegetables that are traditional for um Indian cuisine, so that's like taro root and um, little eggplants, which we grow, like small eggplants, sort of more wild ones, or passion fruit. And then if you think about the Caribbean, you can go to like aji dulce, which is like a small, sweet um, seasoning pepper that um, Cuba uses in its sofrito, very traditional. 
and you can kind of draw on those cuisines and say like, okay, well, those people have been growing those plants in that climate for a very long time. We are in a similar climate, so let's use their food as inspiration to figure out what we can grow in the summer. Also, like, you're not the first person <laughs> to ever try to grow food in the summer, so you don't have to, you know, try and figure this all out on your own. Definitely use resources that are available to you. Our website I consider to be quite a resource. We sell all of our plants online as well and so you don't have to be buying them from us but you can go to our website and you can visit the tropical perennials category or the hot climate veggies category and you'll see all the plants with plant spacing and days to maturity, Latin names, pictures, and then full descriptions of how you use the plant or like, you know, it's nutritional facts, like all the, there's tons of information on there. And there's other companies like us, so Ready to Grow Gardens is a really good one. They're very, they are experts in tropical fruit trees. Um, and there's also like a bunch of bloggers in Florida who are really into uh, tropical food. There's a few key words if you're gonna go online and start doing some research and figuring out what your summer garden is going to look like. Zone 10B, that was a key word. The few other key words I want to explain to you are perennial, food forest, and permaculture. <laughs> okay, so a perennial plant is a plant that lives for more than one year. An annual is a plant that completes its life cycle from germination to fruiting to seed to death within one year. So like lettuce is an annual, you know, you plant the seed, a couple months later you harvest it. If you didn't harvest it, what would happen is it would bolt, so that's just the term for when a plant flowers. Then it would make its seeds, it would hold its seeds in little pods, they would dry. In nature they would split open and fall to the ground and then they would germinate again. And not in nature, like when a human intervenes, you would clip the seeds, save them, and wait to plant them at a later date. That's an annual. A perennial is any plant that lasts more than a year. So most of the summer plants are perennials. Um, okay, permaculture is another really important word. I cannot explain permaculture to you in this class because like people take permaculture design courses that last like two months. It's, it's, uh, it's basically a way of thinking about whole systems within nature where instead of a human like controlling and exploiting the natural environment they're working with it in a cyclical nature so it talks about soil health it talks about building soil cover cropping annuals perennials obtaining a yield stacking your functions which means like making sure that you know, you're growing something where you can harvest like its leaves, its roots, and then a bird can harvest its seed later on. Like, it's a it's a design, it's a way of thinking about nature and man, and particularly growing food. But um, perennial planting systems are very popular in permaculture. So, permaculture encourages you to plant gardens that are longer lasting and more passively managed. So, you know, you plant a tree or something and then you plant things around it and they evolve over time and they become like more permanent and less intensive than if you're trying to plant like, you know, six cilantro crops in a season. You're constantly having to replant, you're constantly having to till the soil. So, um, the last word is food forest. I mean, concept, word, whatever. Food forests are planting, are systems of plants designed to mimic how nature has designed a forest. It's very cool and it's part of permaculture. Permaculture design people love food forests. Basically, as the gardener, you find plants that you want to grow and you plant them in a way that mimics a forest and then as they mature all together like they become a forest system. Okay.
Okay, so you might be thinking, how do I mimic a forest in my backyard? And that's a totally normal question to ask. I think a lot of people haven't really stopped to consider the design, the inherent design present in a forest. So let me break it down for you. In a forest, there are different layers of plants that thrive and grow in different parts of the space that's being taken up by the forest. So there's like the trees that um, grow the tallest and they usually have trunks with not a lot of leaves on them and then they make leaves at the top. Once they burst out of the partial shade of the, as they're growing, then they like make these canopies of tree, of uh, leaves and branches. And they are the ones that then, as mature um, species, make a lot of the shade, the dappled shade of a forest. Those are called upper canopy plants, trees. And then there's a lower canopy. Those are the species that thrive just below them, also trees. Then there's like an herbaceous layer, which is like plants, you know, if you're walking through a forest, you can look up at those trees. They're both up way above you. And then kind of around you, there's like a lower layer of plants and they thrive in partial shade because like that's what they have naturally, you know, they're being provided with partial shade by the upper canopy. And they fill out, you know, if you're walking through the forest and you're getting kind of brushed by stuff, then they're, they're filling out that space. And then there's lower plants. So those are usually um, annuals or native plants that will like flower, go to seed, flower again, they kind of crawl, some of them might crawl around. And then there's a ground cover. There's like, you know, it's like, what are you stepping on? Are you stepping on little oxalic clovers? Are you stepping on little mosses and lichens? You're, you know, you're, are you stepping on some sort of wild mint? And then there's a vine layer. So if you kind of like stop to observe in certain areas, you'll see like vines climbing up the trees and like trying to get all the way up to the light again. And then there's always something decomposing on the ground. So in your backyard, that would be like mulch, but in the, and in the forest, it's also mulch, but it's mulch that the forest has made itself. So it's like, you know, a tree falls and it's, trunk breaks in half and some of it is on the ground and then you know bugs come and eat it and drop other pieces onto the ground and then the leaves of those plants will fall based on the time of year and the ground will get coated with leaves and then funguses will move in and little worms will come and eat all that stuff and decompose it and so it's always like making soil for itself via the detritus that's on the ground and so a food forest replicates all of that. So you as the designer, you get to pick a species or two, depending on how much space you're trying to fill up from each category. And then um, typically people refer to those designed plantings, especially if they're on the smaller side, as a guild. So I made a little drawing. I made, made an old timey drawing for you. Okay, so. I made a little drawing, I know it's not the best, but I really wanted a visual to help explain what a guild would look like. This is like a introduction to food forest beginners guild, so all really easy to use, um, easy to take care of, really popular, easy to grow plants. And one little tip here is Little River Co-op really encourages people to skip the upper, the upmost canopy, the biggest tree. That's because a lot of yards are on the smaller side and maybe you don't have room for like a 40 foot tall mango tree. So a mango would be like the perfect example of an upper story canopy plant, but they get so big that um, oftentimes when we go and install little guilds <laughs> in uh, people's yards, we like to skip the biggest layer because we feel like it adds, it allows people to like have a food forest guild without having that much space. So this one, my tallest tree is a mulberry. Mulberries are 
stay on the smaller side and they also respond really positively to aggressive pruning so you get to be in control of how big the small berry gets. The next smallest one is a pigeon pea. That is a really cool legume where you eat the beans dried or fresh. Uh, and this is all kind of size based so and then under him there'll be a roselle or a cranberry hibiscus or a cotton plant or anything that's like in that um, size and those actually are annuals but um, it's not like everything there aren't really set rules like oh everything in your system has to be a perennial or something it just happens to be that most of the plants that like the summer are perennial but it's not a rule um, under that I've got a small hot pepper plant pepper plants are perennials in places where there's no frost like Miami so uh, and hot peppers love the summer so he's down here and then I've got um, a turmeric back here in the deeper shade because uh, turmeric loves dappled shade and then I've got a few sweet potatoes uh, you know in a world where it's not just a drawing I would have sweet potatoes dotted throughout the island of mulch this is my mulch island that I installed as well to like keep all of these plants happy with their root systems getting nutrients and like fungal networks thriving amongst them. And then you'll see the sun is up here and I wrote south. That's because the system is going to exist for many years. And so yes, in the summer, the sun is directly above our head. So the sun will be actually right here instead. Uh, in the fall the and winter, the sun will move into the south. And it's nice to be able to get like a little bit more sun to all of these species instead of, you know, if I planted it the other way, then the mulberry would be shading them a lot. And I would say that the total square footage of this island uh, would be like 30, 30 square feet. <laughs> Just to give you an example of, of how much space something like this needs, you know, it's not a lot, it's not a lot of space. Okay, so if you're thinking about making yourself some gills, there are some plants that are really good for that, and I've surrounded myself with some of them uh, so that I can show them to you and we can talk about the different um, categories that they fall into. So um, here I have an ever-bearing mulberry plant. So this is one of our favorite. We love, love, love to encourage people to um, plant. Remember, we're skipping the uh, upper canopy. So as a mid-level canopy, we really love to encourage people to plant, plant um, fruit trees that are fast growing and fast yielding. So some fruit trees, like a tamarind or something, is gonna get like 25 feet tall and then like six years later maybe you'll start harvesting some tamarinds. Not that that means I don't think tamarinds are cool. All of the fruit trees uh, that we get to grow down here, the tropical fruit trees, they love the summer, they do really well here, but it's sometimes not that realistic to have like the diversity of fruit tree that you would want um, in your backyard. So. We love encouraging people to, yeah, like start with the really quick growing ones and the easy to care for ones. And so I'd say like the top five in that category are Everbearing Mulberry, which um, makes a mulberry, which is like a delicious little kind of blackberry type guy. Um, papaya, which is over here. Papaya. See my little papaya? <laughs> So this is a three gallon tree. This is a guaranteed female because the nursery that we got it from got it as a tissue cell culture plant. That's a very cool kind of aside where you can go in a lab and you can release specific pieces of their tissue to like um, replicate them. And so by doing that, you're guaranteed to get a female and only the females will make fruit. Papayas, if planted now, now is the right time to plant one of these um, trees or a guild because they really thrive once the rain starts to water them in um, and once the humidity increases. So a papaya, if planted now at this size, will be like covered in fruit by the fall. So it's like very gratifying, you know, or inst it's not instant gratification, but it's as instant as it gets in like a, in a fruit tree kind of way. And then we also uh, love to encourage people to plant guavas, which I don't have a guava like right here to hang out with. Okay. Um, and star fruits and bananas. So bananas are 
an amazing crop that everyone should have in their backyard as far as I'm concerned. They grow really quickly and they love a bunch of, a bunch of mulch and so you can take like all the brown material from your backyard and just like pile it up around your banana and make like a really messy like banana mound and in like a year and you'll start to have like a constant supply of bananas if you have like let's say two trees in your backyard they're very cool. And then um, understory plants there's a whole bunch of them so I just grabbed like a greatest hits over from around our nursery. Um, okay, this is cranberry hibiscus. So the hibiscus family does really well in our tropical climate. And um, fun fact, all hibiscus flowers are edible. But um, this hibiscus, which has this like very beautiful ornamental, um, like purpley reddish foliage, this foliage is edible. And it tastes um, sour, like a sour, acidic, like tartness to it. And it branches really well, so it makes like a really beautiful plant in your landscape. And it, the leaves make a good salad ingredient alternative. During the summer, you know, you can't grow lettuce or kale or arugula, any of that normal stuff. And so you have to get really funky with your salads, which is really fun. And then this is um, cranberry hibiscus, is very popular cousin, Roselle. So this is maybe one of the most popular plants that we grow and sell this time of year. Uh, you can only grow, you can only start this plant as a seed um, for harvest in the fall, like from April to June. And that's because it's um, daylight sensitive, it's day length sensitive. So if you plant it in the fall, it will flower right away and it will stop growing. So you have to plant it in the spring it spends all summer becoming like the most big, beautiful, lush hibiscus plant. And then in the fall, it gets covered in these beautiful pink hibiscus flowers. And then after them, it gets covered in these even more beautiful, very like surreal, jewel toned, like fleshy pods. Uh, and they are the source for hibiscus tea. And so this is like super popular plants called Roselle. This would make a great understory plant. Those are like my taller understory plants that I'm going to show you. And then the next layer would be something like, this is a Thai chili plant. So Thai chilies make little shrubs. You can see it already branching as a baby plant and it's already got some flowers on it. It's very happy. This would love to grow in your food forest. And then there's like a category of plant and I guess just <laughs> the way we refer to them is like weird spinaches. So uh, people use the word spinach to mean like a leaf that is a little bit succulent. Like, you know, a spinach leaf, you can like break it and you can overcook it really easily. Um, the weird spinaches are all like that too. And they're shrubs. So this is like a perennial weird spinach. This is Okinawa spinach. Uh, it has a beautiful purple underside of its leaf. There's also longevity spinach, Suriname spinach. Malabar spinach, which is a vine, a really beautiful vine, and then this is sisu spinach. This is like, we call this guy like the kale of the summer. So this is the easiest to use um, weird spinach that we grow. Okay, so after the weird spinaches, um, they sometimes make like kind of low mounds or like little climbing sections, like they move around. They're not, I don't want to call them a ground cover because Technically, a ground cover is supposed to be something that you can walk on. And I a lot of these plants, you would break them if you walked on them, the weird spinaches. But they do stay kind of low, so they'd be perfect under something like one of these hibiscus varieties. And then we've got kind of another category uh, where I'm going to throw herbs in. So this is a galangal plant. Galangal is a relative of ginger that loves to grow here and makes like a human tall very permanent bed of itself in your garden and it will and so when you need some you just go in with like a sharp shovel and like kind of break a piece off and dig it up uh galangal is not that popular in a culinary sense but it's a really fun plant to have around and it's in a family with other a little bit more popular plants that grow in a similar way which is like partial shade perennial, very happy in the understory of a food forest, and that is ginger and turmeric. So 
Uh, we do sell ginger and turmeric plants, but you can also go, um, I recommend the farmer's market for fresher ginger and turmeric versus going to somewhere like Publix and getting a piece because it, that could be really old. It could have been shipped from really far away. But you can just plant those in your garden. And once it starts to rain, uh, like nature, will just, you'll see them start to shoot up out of your mulch. It's very satisfying <laughs> to do that. Um, okay, and then this plant has a bunch of common names. So far, the most popular common names I've found for it are um, Jamaican oregano and Dominican oregano. Uh, it's in the Lipia family, which, uh, so if you've, if you've ever grown Lantana, for example, which is like a really popular native plant, uh, this might look kind of familiar, or Mujin tea is another plant in this family. Um, this, we're, remember, we're trying to like grow with the seasons and we're trying to like look to other climates and cuisines where people are, you know, not using, like, just everything they can get at the grocery store. They're growing a lot of food for themselves. So, like, instead of going to the grocery store for the summer and getting, like, the normal Italian oregano just because you're used to it, like, in a taste test, you would never know that this was not oregano. It's, like, it's very, very fragrant. It's almost like a mix of oregano and thyme together. And this is a perennial, it's woody stemmed, you can make cuttings out of it really easily and it would love it in your food forest. Another herb I really like is society garlic. So this looks like an allium. Allium is the family for onions and chives and scallions and stuff, but it's not. Um, it's like a different type of tuberosa plant. <laughs> tuberosa. I didn't make that up, but I don't remember what family it's in, but it's not an allium. And uh, it and these, um, it's actually used as a landscaping plant. So you can find this at normal landscaping nurseries. Uh, it makes a beautiful purple flower, and you can eat the, you can eat the plant. You know, you just cut it down low like it's a scallion, and you can cook with the whole thing. And it has a very strong garlic odor. Very, it's very garlicky. And so this is a perennial, you know, once you start like just harvesting it as you need, then it'll shoot right back up. That's another one. And then, okay, Cuban oregano. So you, you might already know this plant. It's very popular. One of the reasons why it's so popular is because it's shade tolerant. Another reason why it's so popular is because it's literally indestructible. You cannot kill this plant. You can neglect this plant like as hard as you can. You can put it inside. You can grow it in only water. I mean, it's like totally indestructible. You can also, if you get a nice big species like this, or if you have a really healthy patch of it at home, you can clip new growth tips and just stick them in the ground, and they'll just make new plant. Or you can, um, schools love to have this around because they'll give branches to kids, and you can put it in water and watch the roots grow, so it, it um, propagates really easily from cuttings. Um, you know, we're talking, I feel like I'm a broken record, talking about what do other cultures do for the flavors that they're looking for, you know, and so Cuban oregano, if you smell it, it's like oregano mixed with like a little bit of lemon mixed with a little bit of thyme, you know, so it's really popular for like fish dishes, but also it's so easy to grow and so much like oregano that like triscuits have it as they're like the like garden herb triscuits you know that have all these like uh, herb flavors added to it instead of using the normal Italian oregano they use Cuban oregano which is sort of like a very fun fact uh, and then I don't have a plant here for you but I want to mention sweet potato sweet potato is like the number one um, food forest guild ground cover option in South Florida. So sweet potatoes are also very easy to grow from cuttings. If you um, don't want to buy plants, like we sell plants and other people sell plants around, but if you don't want to buy plants, you can get a sweet potato at the store and you can like wait until it makes these shoots off of itself. It's probably happened to your food at some point. And then you break those shoots off and you can plant those. Those are called slips. You can also buy slips online, so you can go to a sweet potato slip dealer and get like a 20 set of slips for, you know, I don't know, $12.99 plus shipping. Uh, because sweet potatoes root very easily from cuttings and they're very hardy. Like the slips can come with like no leaves on them anymore and you just stick them in your garden and so long as they get like decent moisture they'll turn into plants. 
And also, if you plant one plant in your food forest, let's say you come here and you get one variety from us, what you can do is, as that plant is vining around in your yard, you can take like a clump of soil or like a little pot of soil, like this much soil, and you can place it on top of a piece of the vine. So bury it, you know, by just putting something on top of it. And then where you did that, it will make new roots. Because even if the whole plant is like through your whole yard because they love like exploring, you're only going to get sweet potatoes where the roots went into the ground, where you planted that initial plant. So if you want more potatoes all around, you can just like mound the soil on top of the vine and it'll make roots into the ground and it'll make you potatoes. Not only does it make you potatoes, but sweet potato leaves are like a very common food source in a, like a lot of different countries. All you have to do is cook them and so you can eat them like spinach once they're cooked. And when you harvest sweet potato leaves for cooking, you're actually doing the sweet potato root crop a favor by pruning the plant because if you let the plant just make as many leaves as it wants, it's going to do that before it makes you tuberous roots because that takes less energy. So if you are constantly pruning off its leaves so that it can't use most of its energy to do that, then it'll make you bigger um, potatoes. And Usually it's like 95 days to maturity for sweet potatoes, but you can also just leave them in the ground for like as long as you want. <laughs> I think a lot of people get kind of attached to their sweet potato ground cover in their food forest and they leave them for kind of a long time, but you, and you can do that too. So the other essential part of the food forest guild design system is mulch, soil and mulch. So South Florida, you know, we have like no topsoil. That's because of our geological history, we used to be underwater, now we're on a oolite rock ridge. You know, certain areas of Miami are very high up, like it's pure rock, you know, something like Coconut Grove, south, um, parts of South Miami. You can look at a topographical map and you can see where the um, Miami rock ridge is, those houses are all higher up which is good for their real estate value in terms of climate change, but it's not good for the person that owns that um, house to try and plant a tree. So um, what you're gonna need to do is like constantly be adding organic material. And what does organic material mean? It just means like some stuff that's gonna decompose. So it can be like your yard scraps, it can be leaves, we love leaves. It can be woody mulch from like whenever FPL comes and trims your trees and you want to get mulch, definitely don't buy mulch. Find like native mulch, mulch that was going to be garbage and now you're turning it into soil. Like we're very pro that mulch. So you're going to want to like, the main thing that your food forest needs from you is mulch, is mulching. Because that's the way that all of those plants are going to get most of their nutrients. And it's also the way that you are going to passively encourage um, fungal pro um, colonies to move into your food forest system. And fruit trees really love having um, funguses, uh, mycorrhizal funguses around their roots. So they'll thrive in an environment where you're, you know, caring for the fungal colonies with mulch. So. Um, one thing I do want to show you today is I'm going to plant a tree for you, like once we get up and start moving around. I'm going to plant a tree for you because we've noticed over the years that people really skimp on tree planting and it makes a really big difference for the success of your tree, like how big a hole you make them and how you add water and fertilizer to it and um, also how you add mulch around the edges. So like. Once we're done talking here, I'm going to take you out into the field and Chris is going to show you his cover crops and I am going to show you how to plant a tree. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about permanent perennial food systems, which take up a different um, type of space in your yard than a raised bed. And you might be really curious about um, what you can do in containers or in your raised bed during the summer. So a lot of the understory plants that we were discussing, like peppers and the herbs and the weird spinaches, you can plant those things in a raised bed. And you can plant a lot of them in pots. 
you can even plant some of the larger plants in larger pots. But one thing that you should consider about planting some of this stuff in your raised bed is whether they are perennials or annuals, or mm, basically how much time that they're going to take up that really precious real estate in your raised bed. Because let's say you have one 4 by 8 foot raised bed, that's 32 square feet of growing space, and you spent all fall, winter, and spring growing uh, normal vegetables in it, and you don't want to let go of growing some herbs and vegetables in your raised bed, so you want to plant some weird summer stuff. Well, if you love turmeric, and you hear me talk about turmeric, and you say, oh, I'm going to put that in my raised bed, you just have to consider, like, you can definitely do it. The turmeric isn't going to, like, reject your raised bed. It's probably going to love it. But you need to consider the amount of time that some of those plants need in order to make you the food, which is why you're growing them. So turmeric, for example, needs a whole year. So if you go and plant, um, like, a third of your raised bed in turmeric right now, then once fall comes and you get excited about lettuce, kale, and tomatoes again, then that third of your raised bed is going to be taken up with turmeric. Or you're going to have to make a decision, which is fine also, but it's like, you know, it's a little bit of like a tricky thing. So it's like, do you want to take out the turmeric early and get a lower yield? Or do you want to take out half of it and get a lower yield and leave the other half for a, for a spring harvest? Or um, you can apply that same sort of questioning, line of questioning to one of the weird spinaches, you know. You bought a weird spinach from us, you planted it in your raised bed, you ate from it all summer. Technically, it's a perennial, so it will live in your raised bed for years. It'll easily take up, if you don't harvest it, if you don't control it, your whole raised bed. I mean, an, an Okinawa spinach left to its own devices will absolutely grow to 32 square feet like if you never harvest it and it lives for years so but that doesn't mean that you can't pull it out but we've noticed over the years of working with home gardeners that they don't like to pull plants out and that's very normal it's because the plant is alive and you spent a long time caring for it and you don't want to just like rip it out you know but also you need to be really competitive about that precious growing space that you have so you can you can grow like a sisu spinach and an okinawa spinach and eat the leaves all summer and then take them out in the winter or take one cutting from that plant and put it in water and put it in a pot and let it grow like kind of slowly over the winter and then like put it back in your raised bed in the summer something like that you can also stick to just annuals so you can put eggplants and Thai basil and I'm like, what else is an annual here? A lot of the stuff here is technically perennials. Uh, and you can put a cranberry hibiscus in there, you know, and you can enjoy those plants as long as they're, um, you're obtaining a yield from them and then you can pull them out in preparation for fall planting. The other thing you can do is you can rest your raised bed. So there's a lot of value to resting your raised bed, and I'll explain the different options for resting it and their value points. Um, basically, the number one thing I want to say about your raised bed... The number one takeaway that I want you to get from this discussion about what to do with your raised bed over the summer is like no matter what you choose to do because they all have a lot of value um, you can't ignore it and leave it empty that's like the worst thing you could do like if you're slowly removing plants and it's starting to get hot and you are losing a little bit of excitement over working outside then like you have to push through <laughs> and figure out something to do with your raised bed because if you just neglect it and it's got like one pepper plant and one oregano plant like languishing through the summer and the rest of it is bare you're gonna be at a detriment come fall whereas if you do one of these few things I'm gonna explain to you you will be at uh, like in a way better place because you will have taken care of your um, raised bed through the off season so 
things you can do. Okay, well, you can just cover it. That's a thing. It's a really low maintenance thing. It's a really cheap thing. There's different ways to cover it. You can cover it with just like a tarp, you know, um, some like scrapped piece of thick plastic and you can just weigh it down in the corners with like cinder blocks or bricks or you know you can get really DIY with it and what that will do um, you might know the term solarizing already that is not really gonna solarize it solarizing is a little bit more technical and needs a little bit more um, planning which I'll get to so you can cover it with plastic that's like my least favorite option I'll start with my least favorite <laughs> My next favorite option is covering it with organic material. So what that's going to do, if you've ever heard the term lasagna gardening, what lasagna gardening is, is it's like you make a lasagna of compostable materials. So that could be, it does not need to be this exact ingredients, but it could be like cardboard, mulch, hay, newspaper, more hay. Or it could be like cardboard, manure, mulch, for example. Like those are both lasagna gardens, but they're both like, they're both like you're adding distinct layers of compostable material right onto the raised bed. You're making it kind of thick and it's gonna like look a little nutty and it's gonna protect and enhance the soil. And then over the summer, it's gonna shrink. It's gonna compost. It's basically like making a compost pile on top of your raised bed and that's going to add new soil and it's also going to like prohibit weed growth so the things that you're trying to avoid by doing something to your raised bed in the summer is you're trying to avoid weeds taking over nature hates bare soil so anytime that any amount of soil is left bare nature is going to find a way to cover it with plants that is like a thing and so um if your soil is left bare, nature is going to fill it with weeds. And you don't want that because um, once a weed, you know, the weeds aren't inherently bad for an empty bed, but they, they do um, harbor specific pests, which you might not want around. And they also make seeds. You know, weeds are super resilient. They're really adaptable. They're going to love the summer and they're going to reproduce really fast. So like a weed that you leave instead of pulling out and putting in your compost might make like 10,000 times itself in seeds and um, when those seeds just go and hang out in your soil and like wait until you till them or add water or whatever that's called a seed bank and a seed bank of the bad kind <laughs> you know it's seeds that you didn't want in your soil and now you're gonna have a really weedy garden so that's one thing and another thing is that you don't want your soil to erode a lot during the heavy rains so if you think about how much power the water has as it moves through the environment, you know, water always finds the easiest route as it collects and moves around. And once it, and it's uh, when it hits your when like a really strong rain hits your raised bed, it's gonna pool, and as it pools, it's gonna. Um, absorb the lightest particles in your soil and those lightest particles are the ones you really want which is basically the composted organic material and then as it drains it's gonna take that with it so you're gonna be left with like mostly sand like a very sandy bed if you allow that water to move through your system so rapidly so if you add a bunch of material to the top not only are you covering the soil so the weeds won't grow on it but you also are making it so that like when the rain comes, basically it has to percolate through. You're making its journey harder and slower. You're slowing down that journey. And so a lot less soil is going to be removed from your raised bed. So that's like the covering technique. And solarizing, like I referred to earlier, solarizing is mostly done if you know you have nematodes. So as you're pulling out your plants at the end of the season, do yourself a favor and inspect their root systems for nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic, so you cannot see them, but they make very distinct damage, and they are one of our most prevalent pests here in South Florida. They're a microscopic ringworm. There are good nematodes and there are bad ones, and they're both present in your soil and everyone else's soil, but unfortunately, the bad ones, which are called um, root knot nematodes, 
they love our sandy poor soils and so they thrive more here so they have higher populations and they live in your plants root systems and they eat them and deform them so if you pull out like a nice healthy plant with um, like no root knot nematodes in its root system it's going to be like long fibrous strands of like complex like very hard to break roots if you pull out a root knot nematode infested plant, its roots are going to be very brittle. Like maybe even when you pull it, a bunch of them don't come. And it's going to be covered in like knots. It's going to look sort of cancerous. You can also Google it. You know, I know that me going like this a bunch is like not as helpful as like seeing it in real life. You can Google root knot nematode damage and you'll see a ton of like side by side comparisons. And it should be relatively easy for you to figure out if you have root knot nematodes. If you do, you can solarize to try and kill some of them and what that is it's like you take a clear piece of tarping um, of plastic that you buy somewhere like specifically for this it has to be kind of thick and you water your garden which kind of like activates you know it, it activates that like you're basically trying to make like greenhouse effect but like right on the surface of your soil so you would heat it uh, you would add water so that there's like a heating going on, like a warming, and then you, and then you put this, you have to make it really, really, really like perfectly smooth, and then you put the plastic like really right smooth over it, and you pin it down, and there has to be like almost no space, because you're trying to like make it super duper duper hot in like the first two inches of your soil, and what that does is things like earthworms that you want to keep, they're going to be like, oh my god, it's so hot up here. I got to like, bloop, 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 and they're going to like go deeper. But ringworms are so tiny, they're almost immobile. And so they will stay up there and they will fry. And um, you can put a thermometer in and kind of like check the temp of those first few inches of soil. And I don't have it memorized, but you're supposed to make sure that you keep the soil at a certain temperature for a couple of weeks. And then... Um, and then theoretically, you would have killed all those nematodes. Okay, and the final thing that you might want to do to your raised bed, which is like one of our favorite soil conditioning things, is cover cropping it. So um, we're going to go visit Chris French. He runs the farm that operates on the same property as us. He's cover cropping his fields right now, and he's going to like explain cover cropping to us and take us on a little tour and even show us how to incorporate cover crops into your soil when you're done with the process. on the same property as us and it does really cool stuff and grows really beautiful vegetables and he is in the midst of cover cropping his field right now he's got like a whole elaborate plan that we do not need to get into but um, there is some cover crop for us to look at out here and so I know this is a farm and so you're thinking like cover cropping is big and, and fancy and farmers do it but you can really easily do it on a small scale in your backyard in your raised bed and um, there are a bunch of really cool reasons to do it and i'm gonna let chris tell you about them okay so yeah let's start with the cool reasons uh, why we cover crop um, many of us you know there's a, have just a lot of open space in our garden in the summertime and so you kind of need to do something with that and you could just cover it for the summer or you could just let it go fallow, but weeds yeah. would take over. I said, whatever you do, don't let it go fallow. No, you could. I'm saying, I'm going to tell you why you should. Oh, okay. okay. So, the cover crop, the, the most number one thing for creating healthy soil is having green plants growing as much as possible. If it wasn't your garden, it would be weeds. If you let it go fallow, it'll become weeds and nature will take care of it. Whereas a cover crop is basically something we have a little bit of control over and we can, and these plants are special in a, in a number of ways. And so we can use them as a tool 
to sort of help improve our soil over the summer. And the main reason why having the green plants is so important is because plants feed the biology in the soil. And it does it better than adding mulch, it does it better than adding compost, and so having really healthy green plants is the sort of the number one thing for our soil ecology. Um, the ecology is like all of the little microscopic um, life forms that we can't really control or explain very well, all the way up through like the macro fauna of the soil, which would be like the earthworm. And the and, toads and, and the, the centipedes yeah. and, and insects. And they need roots to live in, right? It's like their city. Like the, the roots in, in this patch, right, are kind of like their city. Like they live in them and they eat them, right? Or yeah, and there's the flowers, of course, bringing in uh, bees, but also uh, beneficial insects. I mean, you're kind of keeping the party going, if you will. And, and, and that's, it's, that's very important. You're um, also growing green manure. Right? The term is green manure for like when you grow a plant so that it makes you green pieces and then you compost those green pieces on site and that's how you make soil yeah. basically. It's like you take the green stuff and you decompose it on your soil and it like becomes soil. As so well as the roots. Okay, so it, it so just to go over like the main reasons for cover cropping are weed suppression. Because look, this is a 40 day, right? This has been here for 40 days. If there was nothing else here, this would be a carpet of weeds, right? Yeah, a and carpet. I think that's, I, I was sort of getting back to like the reason why these cover crops are tools for us is be, and one of the reasons is they germinate faster than your weeds. Mm -hmm. And so the, this buckwheat that's behind us here, we can sort of show it to you when it's small, but it it's up and above and creates a complete canopy before the weeds can even get out of the ground. Right, so it outcompetes the weeds for the space. And also, cover crops, you can't just plant a plant in your garden and be like, it's a cover crop. There are very specific varieties that are, that are chosen based on climate and also chosen based on like what they do for your garden. So a lot of cover crops like don't, uh, like bad bugs don't like them. You know, so if you have a aphid problem or something like your, if your garden is all buckwheat, those aphids aren't gonna have anything to eat. So you're gonna like slowly starve them out. That's a good thing, you know? And also, um, so like this is buckwheat. We'll talk about buckwheat next, but I want you to talk about sun hemp, which there isn't any sun hemp in the field, but. Yeah, for, yes, there, there is yeah. not, but for but a very good But that's for a reason, reason. okay. <laughs> so yeah, the, the this, buckwheat cover crop is extremely fast and so we're using it as a placeholder for our next cover crop which is going to be sun hemp and which is sort of probably what most people are going to use in their garden um, because it's uh, a nitrogen fix fixer it lasts an appropriate amount of time 60 days which is kind of about the most amount of time we sort of want to um, well anyway it's, it fits in the summer pretty well for the most home gardeners. I, I had a little bit of extra time and so I put the buckwheat in there too. Tell us what nitrogen fixing is all about. Oh, uh, nitrogen fixing is uh, the, 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 the legumes, the, the sun hemp has a, re, has a relationship with the bacteria in the soil um, where that bacteria can take nitrogen out of the air that's in the soil and um, you know basically put nitrogen, makes these little nitrogen nodules and that will be, that's putting nitrogen in the soil, which is an important, um, important nutrient for the next crop that goes in in the fall. It's actually, so whatever you're planting then. like the coolest plant thing. Like yeah. you are growing your own tangible material fertilizer. Yeah. Like it doesn't get more organic fertilizer than that. You know, normal organic granular fertilizer, which is what we use in gardens. It's what we sell to you. It's what Chris uses. That's like mostly animal byproduct, you know, feather meal, bone meal, blood meal, chicken manure, turkey manure, all that stuff. This is like a bacteria that you didn't even put there. <laughs> like, like knows that there's a legume growing, like legume roots, and it like moves in and colonizes the roots. And then it uses the plant's green material to like take nitrogen from the air 
which is like so crazy. And then use the plant to store it in nodules in their root system. We love showing people. I wish I could do this now, but maybe there's a video online where it's like you pull the sun hemp roots out after 60 days and it's like covered in these little crystals basically. And those crystals are actual nitrogen. Once you cut that cu cover crop down, as that those roots die in the soil, which is like a good thing, it'll slough the nitrogen nodules into the soil. And then the next crop to be planted there, there's like food there already for them. It's like the coolest. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of the most magic and sort of common uh, of these really complex relationships that are in the soil biology that we sort of get to encounter all the time. I mean, we, we're always needing to pull the clover out of the sun. And then like, Look at the nitrogen nodules. It's working. The magic is working. But uh, buckwheat does not do that. It, it acidifies the soil. It does some other stuff. I, I, in my opinion, the, the coolest thing is, you know, bringing the insects in and then the fact that it's, it really fits in a, a nice little time slot and it's really easy to get uh, to get rid of. And so we're, I think we're going to yeah, sort of segue say, into... That's my favorite. My favorite thing about buckwheat as someone that helps people garden for a living is that like the sun hemp is a little bit harder to deal with. It's almost like the intermediate um, cover crop because it lasts for 60 days. It gets as tall as you do. It gets kind of woody stemmed. It can be hard to manage or people get intimidated by it. I, I know I see a lot of people like start sun hemp cover crop and then get really confused about what to do next and reach out to us like way too late when it's like flowered already and and, like, and they're like what was I supposed to do? Buckwheat is almost like takes care of itself like this is a really quick cover crop this is like 27 days or something 30 days this is 40 days and then look at 40 days it's seeding itself already so like yeah we have to get rid of it before it before well, it goes to seed so all the some way. some people though like to have it go to seed in their garden because then it'll kind of just like it'll basically you'll you'll like smash it down after it goes to seed or you can just leave it and it'll become kind of an ugly mess because it it kills itself I guess is what I'm trying to say like sun hemp doesn't really kill itself in such a convenient way that buckwheat does you know and and also it's harder for you as a human to kill sun hemp than it is buckwheat like this is as tall as it ever gets and its stems are very like watery and hollow and soft and then its material is really soft too so like Chris is going to show you how he's allowing it to decompose over there but it's like it'll decompose like really quickly whereas the sun hemp takes longer because it's way more fibrous you know sun hemp is also a fiber crop like people grow it as a fiber so it's like kind of a strong plant Okay, so you want people to watch you clear your nasturtium bed and broadcast seeds. I think we should, you want to do it? Sure. Okay, so we're going to like, Chris is going to give you a little like start to finish cover crop moment. Starting with taking some old crops out of his nasturtium bed. Okay. <laughs> so your garden might have a bunch of not very handsome plants in it like this nasturtium bed does you know these nasturtiums produced leaves and flowers for us all season but nasturtium they hate water they hate being watered that's like a really fun fact like when you have them in your garden and they're thriving make sure you water them as soon as possible um all of this all of this decomposing material can go into your compost pile. Yeah. We, I know we didn't talk about composting in this workshop, and that's because I literally talk about it in every other workshop. I'm always like, and don't forget, like, you better be composting. Um, but it's like, this time of year is the perfect time of year to be composting because, like, look at all this material that, Chris, that Chris's little garden bed made that needs to be composted. I'll just know? leave it here as a straw, actually, because Mike's sort of the scale we're at. But let's pretend this is someone's garden. They're not going to just like dump it out the edge, you know? So if you don't have a compost pile already, you definitely want to consider making one now. Um, South Florida summer is also basically composting season. So like 
Everything is always composting in Miami because it's so hot and humid here, but it gets hotter and humider in the summer. And so we can make compost very, very quickly and very efficiently, and especially when we're removing a bunch of material from our raised bed. Okay, so this is cover crop seed. Yeah, this is sun hemp. Um, this is about a pound. This is how much uh, Little River sells, uh, sort of for the, and it'll probably actually do you about three beds, but you could also just dump it all in one bed. Um, the reason being is it'll actually uh, overcrowd itself and that'll be better for weed suppression and it'll also be the stems won't get as big and so it'll actually be easier for you to break down just because there'll be so many plants in there competing with each other. So it's okay to overseed, uh, especially in sort of the small garden setting. So I'm just going to take this and we're going to broadcast here and we have sort of some bare soil um, and I'm just going to go like that. and. Sprinkle it out. Do it kind of nice and uniform. It's really satisfying. This is called broadcasting. Yeah. All right. So see, I have some left over here. And also, this is two feet by eight feet. A raised bed is usually four by eight. So yeah. we like to okay. give people a pound of cover crop because we want to make sure that they get it really uniform and dense. You know, because that's like yeah, the key to it. Okay. So we're just going to chop it in using this, just a normal rake. Um, and I just sort of, if I have to do a bunch of this, it's really important, you know, you want to keep your back straight and stuff. But. The reason why he's doing this is because you want to bury those seeds, but you don't want to be like a crazy person and be burying those seeds, yeah, like so one by not, one. <laughs> so I'll just smooth but it out. But if they sit on the surface of the soil, then it's going to be harder to get them to properly germinate because you're going to be in charge of watering these super consistently as they germinate like the key to having them all germinate is consistent water because once something starts to germinate if it dries out it doesn't just like go back into its dormancy yeah. it dies it's worth right? noting though that a lot of cover crops are very drought tolerant plants and once you basically get the soil covered they have very strong root systems and these are sturdy plants especially the sun hemp the sun hemp just loves the summer here and it can just take an August day or actually by August you're probably cutting it down but right but during I like to tell people that during like the first seven days they have to water every day yeah yeah you, know, you want to do you want to do a good job with your cover crops yeah. you don't want to that's sort of a farmer thing too uh, farmers don't like a lot of times that they slack off because they're not going to make money on this crop per se but it is just as important and it doesn't really work out if you slack off on it so but once you get it established uh, it's good to go Okay, show us your one week old germinated. Okay. Take us on a little tour. Okay, we had this week. We germinated this last week. And we, we use a, a seed drill, or, you know, so we actually, it's sort of just a machine that plants these in little lines. But um, you can see how fast it's, it's, it's growing. Um, there's some little weeds down there that are just, they're not going to stand a chance. This grass is coming up from something else, but um, so you can see how it just, even at one week, it can just make a canopy. Somebody once described this as planting a lawn in their raised bed to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, crazy, lawn, because my mind went like, grass, grass is bad, grass is permanent. But, but what they meant was like, solid I think you know like they were trying to figure out what they were seeing based on what they're familiar with and they were like oh you know yeah it, it is and then I was like yeah it is kind of like a lawn you're trying to make like a solid patch of plant you know mm -hmm. instead of like in your raised bed you're used to like this plant here and this plant here and proper spacing and, yeah. and like having a lot of open areas so that the things can kind of and with this, it's like, no, you're trying to make like a carpet. And what we'll do here, just on the farm side, we'll actually, we'll actually put more mulch and leaves in these pathways here where, where the tractor wheels go. But, um, so, but if, if you don't, if you're not on a raised bed and you're on sort of more of this sort of mound system, uh, you can do that, you know, pile up a bunch of hay in the summer so you still have a footpath. And then okay. we can go over here. So these are what? This is like 30 days. Uh, not even, really. Honestly, that might be 25 days. Um, this was probably 35. And then we just, we, there's a whole area of this that we knocked down. Um, we're going to show you how to knock down. I'm going to grab my rake here. Uh, you can, like, go out there with a the machete and make a big mess, but 
this is a lot. I want to show them my technique too. This is a lot. Okay, okay. we'll show you. Show your technique. Okay. So my technique <laughs> is stomping on them. Okay. <laughs> um, because I know that usually you're not supposed to walk in your raised bed, but I feel like if there's ever a time to walk in your raised bed, it's like before like the summer. Yeah, when, the earthworms you know, are going to fix it. Right. So I like to like help people to just do this. Yeah. Because we did used to like, um, we used to use a machete and we used to tell people, get your weed whacker out, you know, even with sun hemp, I like to do this Yeah. because it's so, if you go in a, in a, if you make a little system out of it, even when your sun hemp is like this big, you see how it's all kind of pushing itself like in a neat way. You can kind of walk one way down your bed and have all your sun hemp lay in the same direction and then like go in the other direction on the way back. Like, Right, you're using a ring? No, I, I use this, this, this thing over here. Uh, this is actually our dibbler, but it works great. And you can just use a two by four with some strings. That's what a lot of people do. Um, did you say this is crimping? This is what we This is, oh yeah. So look, what we're doing here and in all these different ways, this is referred to as crimping. Down. And then, um, usually what it's good to do is to put some compost on top of this. Do we have some compost? Yes, I ha so I have some soil right here. So on a home bed system, this is what we like to tell people. Crimp it and then smother it. So Chris is doing a few other things, but let me show you crimp and smother. Crimp and smother. Because you, it only would take like, let's say four buckets of soil to do the old crimp and smother on a raised bed. So look, if you crimp and smother, why are we doing this? Okay, we're doing it because if you're familiar with composting at all, when you have a green material and you're trying to use it to get nitrogen into your system, then you have to cover it with brown material. If you leave it uh, available, like you can yeah. do that. You could leave this like this and in in six days, it would all be um, like hay. Actually, if you look, uh, Kevin, if you back up a little bit, like Chris has left it here. And you can see it drying out. Like straw. It looks like straw. But that means that this is going to become carbon. If we cover it at this stage, it's going to become nitrogen. So that's why we tell people. I think it just, uh, honestly, it, it gets pretty complicated, but it's, in my opinion, it's just it'll decompose faster if you put if you, if you sort of put some compost on top of the um, but it could be leaf matter or well, you could just simply cover it with a tarp and, and it will disappear this this so usually, I like to do this and then hey because then if you don't cover this then what did I say about like leaving soil bare and then it's like this is bare soil oh I thought you were gonna put a tarp over it no no tarp okay yeah. this and then hey yeah but show them your tarp that and then that has a name too so yeah, this is the way we do it because it's even faster. I'm trying to get rid of this this buckwheat uh, residue as fast as I can so that I can, or just not get rid of it because I, I actually, I, I mowed it and it's off in the pathways. But um, just to break it down so that I can I can rake it up. So look, then... if you look at the, cr the heavy stuff in the pathway, here, pull it back a little further. If you look here, this is like composting, like it's hot. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you clip your grass and you get all those grass clippings in a bag and then you leave them for like an hour or something and they get like, they start to get hot. That's yeah. because they're yeah, this part starting. Yeah, really hot. That's, well, that's, I mean, like the decomposing is starting, like it's rotting or whatever. As green, as like a bunch of green material. And, and that's be, and it's getting to do that because it's covered with a tarp. So this is called occultation. And also the, the I like using the tarps because um, down now that I've mowed this, uh, there will be little seeds coming up uh, or little weed seeds and they'll they'll really just take this opportunity and by putting this tarp on like here's one right here. like this guy is just Toast. you know off to the races right now. but with the tarp it'll get hot enough down here to kind of, It'll just, it'll kill those, that next flush of weeds off. Uh, I, you know, my, my cover crop scheme, it's, it's a whole lot of, of weed management as well as fertility.
utility management. We, we use the two things in, in, in combination there. Yeah, so this is Chris's buckwheat system. Once the buckwheat rotation is complete, then he'll come back in with a sun hemp rotation. It takes longer. So usually um, we tell people to like count backwards from October 1st to kind of figure out like the last chance that they have for sun hemp. Although it's still okay to plant sun hemp and not get it to 60 days. Like you could do a 25 day sun hemp. I'd almost you know? recommend it. Yeah, it's if, almost if, if better because it it's too like long, more manageable. The sun hemp will turn into these like really trees. big fibers and you'll have a and it'll just be a lot harder to break down if you still have them kind of spindly and small we kind of overseeded them uh it'll just be a way quicker turnaround in the fall to get planted with other right. stuff so what I was just without having to remove ah. them you know and put them in like just having to cut all the, the sun out yeah so but what I was kind of getting at is like summer is long you know summer is many months it's like May now, June, July, August, September. So it's five months of managing your soil without food in it. And so you can kind of like look at those five months and make yourself a plan. And it's like everyone's plan is different. Like there isn't really like a go-to. It's like this year you're doing a buckwheat rotation. Some of it's getting occulted, occultated. Some of it isn't. And then you're doing a sun hemp rotation and then you're letting that decompose and then you're starting but and, and then also the, the the tarps are moving around so it's like some of it will be like fallow under tarp which i was explaining earlier is totally an option for people like fallow under tarp mm -hmm. or hay and then you yeah. move the hay later you know so it's kind of like you get to as a gardener like figure out which thing you want to try and there's always a bit of awkwardness when you kind of have some beds or a bed and there's like one big rosemary in it, you know, and, um, and maybe something else you care really about, like a turmeric, but then like you have all this other open space. But I think buckwheat is really good for that. No, because, yeah, yeah, whereas the sun hemp would outkill. the sun hemp would kill them, yeah. yeah. But we also love to tell people, like in your example, the big rosemary, like when we plant gardens for people and when we talk about planting gardens, we're always like, put the stuff that might survive through the summer on the edges. Right. so that you can kind of like go work around them but yeah buckwheat I mean look it doesn't get that tall and so you could kind of like leave your rosemary and it wouldn't kill yeah. it yeah one thing I wanted to add um, with the because we've only been talking about buckwheat and sun hemp there's a lot of other things that are cover crops you could grow cow pea is a great one um, sunflowers and you can mix them together and, and have like what we call a guild and have all these different plants growing together uh, that's a lot of farms do that on a large scale and a lot of uh, garden people do that so don't think you just have to do one species you also don't have to just cover crop your raised bed you know last year this woman came and bought like a lot of pounds like 10 pounds of buckwheat and I was like what are you doing buying 10 pounds of buckwheat for me and she was like oh well I just got this beehive I want to make a med. I want to make them like a little temporary meadow, all of my bees. And so she was broadcasting it like in her yard. Like she yeah. didn't have grass, you know. So she like made herself like a buckwheat meadow. That's like my like, dream job. Do that too. Meadows. <laughs> I think I, a, a, a lot of farmers love cover crops because it just is so much fun to see the meadow kind of come up, mm -hmm. and and to see. I don't know. There's just a sort of a, an aura that comes off of it. Um, all the flowers. You can see it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. All right, thanks, Chris. Okay, so wait. Do you want to help me plant a tree? <laughs> <laughs> Reluctantly planting a tree. Okay, so now we're in um, a part of the farm that we refer, to, we refer to as the family garden. It's where we grow herbs, edible flowers, experiments, and food we want to eat. Uh, it's in its late stages, <laughs> so might look a little crazy there's not a lot of food in it um, we want to show you really quickly how to plant a tree because even though that doesn't seem that exciting um, a lot of people do it wrong <laughs> so um, Chris is gonna dig a hole for the tree we're gonna plant this three gallon mulberry tree um, three gallon refers to the size of the pot so this is like a really standard size fruit tree that you would get from us or another fruit tree farm uh, nursery and um, I don't remember which old timer told us once they were like, you can't dig a $1 hole for a $5 plant. Do you remember who said that? 
<laughs> um, and I was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> um, because I, and I think that that's what a lot of people do. Yeah, they so if you did, buy a $25 tree, you want to take a $25 wall. Right, so this is a $30 tree. You know, that's the going rate. You know, we charge $30 for this tree, but everyone that would sell you this tree would charge you $30 for it. So you got to dig yourself like a $50 hole for this thing. We've noticed that people give up on the size and the, on the width and the depth of their hole pretty quickly. And a lot of times they'll leave the roof ball exposed. So, they, you know, meaning, meaning they didn't even submerge the whole, you know, pot that it came in the ground. And that's like a big no-no. So, so, sorry, go ahead. Um, depending on what you're planting, you may or may not want to mix in a lot of sort of compost and soil. A lot of trees are just fine with having be planted in the native soil. We tend to add one seven gallon bucket of okay, soil. Okay, and then like mix, as it a in. And mix it in. So yeah, it's if like you have really, thing. really sandy soil, you definitely want to do that. This is some pretty nice soil. So I would maybe just put it on top. But okay, so I should mix that in, right? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, please. It's crazy. Um, you viewers can't see, but we dug into a fire ant um, colony. <laughs> so it's yeah. pretty intense in there. Yeah. But so, ha this is a seven gallon bucket of soil. This is how we sell soil so that we can Oops. reuse the buckets. Um, but like, um, an average bag of soil from the store is 2.8 cubic. It's like, so you'd use like a half a bag in here. And Chris is just amending the native soil with this new soil. And I have fertilizer too. Okay. And then this is like a, this is a 464 NPK organic fertilizer granular. And I'm not being scientific here. I'm just making sure that the plant has a little something to eat when it's in there. So I just put five handfuls in there. You can also get fruit tree fertilizer. That would be ideal. But I didn't have any. I don't have any on me. And so I'm going for, you know, better than nothing. Okay, so here's your three-gallon mulberry. We have a nice little hole there. Put it in. with yeah, fertilizer. I wanted to show them, like, how much bigger the hole is. Oh. Maybe it needs a little bit more so, time. Oh, that's not big enough. So I should go deeper, right? More digging, yeah. Yeah, because kind of here's the level of the soil, so you kind of want the root ball at the level of the soil there. More, wanna... fi more fire ants. <laughs> more fire ants, more rocks. Yeah, it's really normal to start encountering a lot of rocks. Right when the, right when the digging gets hard, that's when you're going to want to keep going <laughs> instead of give up. <laughs> Right when the fire ants are really all over your boots. Yeah. That's... Okay. I think that's good. Okay. Um... It's nice to also make... You see how Chris is making himself kind of a volcano of soil? That's because we're putting it back. So a yeah, lot don't, of don't people throw the, soil. throw the soil. We see a lot of people do that. They're like, where do I put it? Oh, I'll put it over here in my grass. And then you're like, then what? You know, so it's like... Make yourself like a little mountain. Okay, so I've took it out. What I like to do, or everyone sort of does, is just sort of go around and kind of loosen this. You can't, a lot of trees, if they've been in the pot too long, they'll be kind of root bound. The roots will be spiraling around. Just kind of loosen them up gently. Um, you don't have to like break it all apart. Breaking it all apart is actually the opposite of what you want to do because when you're transplanting something, in order for it to not have transplant shock from the experience, want to leave most of the roots undisturbed you know and so Chris was just taking the few roots that he saw curling around the pot and releasing them from like the vine but like you know don't like go and like mess with the whole pot and make it all loose because um, until this plant establishes like secure roots it won't be able to absorb water no matter how much you water it and, and it might end up dying if you if you you know disturb the roots yeah. a lot a lot so now what we're going to do is, because it's fire ants, I'm not going to use my foot. Normally I'd use my foot, but I'm going to sort of neatly push the soil back around. I think when I get it, when I get about halfway in, go around, kind of tamp it down a little bit. And you see, I'm sort of keeping the volcano thing going here. And so that I have a little donut depression, which is going to be great because I can, it's going to make, when I water this, all that water is going to go right to the basically the root zone as the you know because the plant doesn't really have roots outside of this one little area the shape of its pot and so having um, this 
will focus the water into that sort of right where the plant needs it to get established. Sandy soil, which is what we have here, even if you add stuff to it, it's still going to end up being really sandy. Sandy soil is what they call hydrophobic, so it's afraid of water. So if you make, like, I think what we see people do wrong so much is instead of making an indent like a donut, they make a pyramid because they didn't bury their roots enough and then it like and it makes kind of like a little mound when you water that little mound then the water just trickles just goes away from the root system down the down the slide you know and if you make a, a donut then when you water you can see it fill up and stay right there i think it's good to put a little nutrients a little around top it. dressing a little, a little top dressing in that in that because <laughs> it'll dissolve and go in with that water mm -hmm. and then you can put the mulch um, on top of this, and the mulch doesn't need to look like a donut too. It's more that, that the, sort of the soil looks like a donut shape depression. But I like to still tell people to make their mulch look like a donut, and one of the reasons why is because I've noticed that when you don't say donut, people will put mulch right up against their um, the stem, which is bad. Right, yeah, we want to keep this area clear. Almost, almost bare dirt, I mean, just in almost case. Almost bare, yeah, very, because um, um, you are trying to like make fungal things happen here, but fungal things are bad for the stem of the plant. So um, you want to like pull that mulch away from the stem so that it doesn't get like a fungal issue. Yeah. And then re be really generous with your mulch, especially it's like, you know, you brought it over here. Yeah, it'll also keep the weeds from getting in. It'll keep your landscapers from coming and like hitting it with a weed whacker. So you kind of want to give that, that stem a lot of clearing. Having grass right up against the stem is always going to be problematic. Right, and, and this is not a one-time thing. So this is a planting thing. And then whenever you see the mulch donut go away or the, or the grass, fire ants, or the grass coming towards, growing back and coming towards your plant, you have to like reestablish this. So you never want the grass to be like right up against the stem of your plant. Like whenever I see people with little fruit trees and they're like, what's wrong with my fruit tree? And it's like, the grass is literally like yeah. right up there. The plant Eventually needs, they'll make enough shade. Right, but not when yeah. they're little. So yeah. it's like, you need to basically make it feel like it's already made itself a forest of like, you know, stuff on the ground. Like that's making nutrients for forest it. Forest floor. Forest floor, but like you made it. Yeah. <laughs> And then let's pretend we're watering it. Water it in. <laughs> yeah, I like to just put the hose just so it's trickling out like a tiny bit and just leave that hose and then set yourself a little timer and come out a few hours later. I mean, you kind of really want a, a nice moist column of water all around that plant. And then after you do that, you can like step away from it and it's gonna just survive off the yeah. summer rain. Especially or... this close to the rainy season. So we're filming this, what day is it? May 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th? Yeah in the middle of May. <laughs> and so June, I mean, it's already started. It's a cloudy day. It's been really windy. Um, it started to rain a little bit, like, you know, weather-wise. So the rains will be coming. And once the rains come, your plants, because they're appropriate to our climate, are gonna like really take off. So until it starts raining, you kind of have to water it. But like, that's one of the reasons why we tell people to plant fruit trees now, is that so they can benefit from that like long, hot, humid, rainy summer of growing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess that's it.